What if the Back to Africa movement succeeded? With each passing day, it seems like racial tensions grow worse in America. With protests and rioting filling our news feeds, it feels worthwhile to ask, what if America had a much smaller African American population? What if the Back to Africa movement was realized almost fully as intended by key figures in the 19th century? You see, the root of America's persistent racism lies in slavery and the various slave codes. The American South was a slave society, not merely a society with slaves. However, following the abolition of slavery, laws similar to the slave codes continue to oppress black people. If you stumble across some of the accounts of brutal lynching after lynching and vicious dehumanization experienced by African Americans, you might be wondering why they didn't simply leave the United States. Why not flee to safer confines, especially Africa? The short answer is, some did. The Back to Africa movement of the 19th century said that African Americans should return to Africa, not to the homelands of their ancestors, which in most cases were unknown, but to the continent overall. In general, the movement was an overwhelming failure. Very few free slaves wanted to move to Africa, and the small number that did, some under duress, initially faced brutal conditions. As the failure became known in the United States in the 1820s, it spawned and energized the abolitionist movement. Liberia and Sierra Leone became independent black countries after Haiti on January 1, 1804, and became the second and third of the only three countries founded by former slaves. The U.S. ambassador to Liberia was a coveted position. In the 20th century, Marcus Garvey, Rastafarians, and some other African Americans espoused the concept, but few actually left the United States. In the 1800s, as the number of free blacks exploded, many white Americans wondered what to do with them and didn't generally believe that they could integrate into society. So why didn't everyone pack their bags and sail over to Africa? So the movement declined following many hoaxes and fraudulent activities associated with the movement. According to some, the most important reason for the decline in the Back to Africa movement was that, quote, the vast majority of those who were meant to colonize did not wish to leave. Many free blacks simply did not want to go, quote unquote, home to a place from which they were generations removed. America, not Africa, was their home, and they had little desire to migrate to a strange and forbidding land, not their own, end quote. They often said that they were no more African than Americans were British. So what was the meaningful impact from the movement? Starting in 1816, the American Colonization Society, which counted future presidents James Monroe and Andrew Jackson among its members, began planning a colony in Africa for free blacks. By 1822, Liberia received immigrants from America. However, Liberia struggled to get off the ground. Along with the difficulty of gaining enough land, life proved hard for these early settlers. Disease was widespread along with the lack of food. Hostile tribes presented the settlers with great struggle, destroying some of their new land settlements. Almost 50% of the new settlers died in the first 20 years after their arrival in Liberia. So to recap, the primary reasons for the failure of the Back to Africa movement included black Africans seeing themselves as fully Americans in culture and due to the major failure of Liberia. In this alternate timeline, let's say that Abraham Lincoln approves a plan to slowly resettle freed blacks in Africa after the Civil War. This is what the great emancipator himself had to say on the subject. Quote, my first impulse would be to free all the slaves and send them to Liberia, to their own native land. But a moment's reflection would convince me that whatever of high hope, as I think there is, there may be in this, in the long run, its sudden execution is impossible. If they were all landed there in a day, they would all perish in the next 10 days, and there are not surplus shipping and surplus money enough in the world to carry them there in many times 10 days. Honest Abe was all for colonization as late as 1864, then finally threw his hat out of the ring when the insane logistics made him tear his hair out. Abe had tried to settle blacks closer in the Americas in Panama, Haiti, and Belize before failing every single time. Also, black men could fight for the Union, which was always a plus. In an alternate timeline, Abe decides to implement a gradual system of Africans leaving for Liberia. It proves a larger amount of funds towards the project. He decides not to give limited suffrage to blacks, and after the Civil War, Blacks are increasingly oppressed and begin leaving for Africa in larger numbers. In our timeline, the Back to Africa movement saw a revival in 1877, at the end of the Reconstruction Era, as many blacks in the South faced violence from groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. Interest among the South's black population in African emigration peaked during the 1890s, a time when racism reached its peak and the greatest number of lynchings in American history took place. The continued experience of segregation, discrimination, and the belief that they would never achieve a true equality attracted many blacks to a pan-African emancipation in the motherland. You had to put yourselves in the shoes of a 19th century African-American. If you feared for you and your children's lives, 
you would most likely toss out any preconceived notions of being American and look to secure your safety. As the 1800s draws to a close in this alternate timeline, substantial amounts of African Americans leave for Liberia and various other destinations such as Sierra Leone, which is founded by the British to house freed slaves. You also have to make Liberia more appealing for freed slaves. You can't flee the KKK and end up dying of malaria in some unexplored African jungle. For the majority of Liberia's history, it was essentially a one-party state run by a tiny ethnic minority, Americo Liberians. These were the descendants of the original ex-slaves from the United States, along with some later ex-slaves. Whereas America would later come to rely on massive waves of immigration, the Americo Liberians were a more restrictive set. This was a tiny portion of the population, around 5%, and voter franchise was held almost entirely within that community. In addition, the government was in effect a single party state under the true Whig government, which was in power from 1878 onward. The government thus inherently focused on the interests of the small Americo Liberian population for most of its history, and hence focused on areas with high Americo Liberian populations the coastal areas, especially Monrovia. The interior, which held the majority of the population, the indigenous tribes, was left relatively undeveloped and the indigenous population didn't receive suffrage until the 1960s. With magnitudes more American Liberians in an alternate timeline, I think the most feasible course of action would be simple expulsion of native tribes, just like good old-fashioned imperialism. I think with so much more people, the Liberians could expand to be much larger in Africa's interior, essentially taking a bite out of French West Africa. I doubt the French would be able to claim these interior regions if Liberians settled there first, considering they negotiated the borders in their original timeline with Liberia and Britain in the late 19th century, well after a hypothetical mass influx of African Americans. How would this larger, more Americanized Liberia develop? The US would most likely sink larger investments into the area if a substantial majority of the black population leaves America. In our original timeline, Liberia ultimately failed because the United States government refused to pledge adequate monetary support as well as defenses for the settlers, coupled with the freed slaves' unwillingness to go back to Africa once being freed. Liberia with a much more massive population and with greater levels of industrialization will be able to build a more egalitarian, sustainable society than in the original timeline. So with the Americans turning Liberia into a relatively well-off protector in Africa, let's look at the situation in the States. America without African Americans would be radically different in culture. Just take a glance at all of the celebrities today in America who are of African American descent. The Harlem Renaissance would not take place and any contributions to culture would be very muted. I guess more classical music, no jazz, and hip hop? Also, after the Civil War, plantation and landowners in the South regained their land but lacked a labor force. The solution was sharecropping which enabled the government to match labor with demand and began the process of economically rebuilding the nation via labor contracts. However, sharecropping locked much of the South into reliance on cotton, just at the time when the price of cotton was plunging, not to mention trapping blacks in endless debts. In an alternate timeline, sharecropping doesn't take off. Even if it does, two-thirds of all sharecroppers in our timeline were white, so it could theoretically happen on a smaller scale. What would an America that was much more racially homogenous and white look like? It would be a very different nation. Racism is inherent to many societies. It could be even worse on an individual basis when most of the population has no contact with other white Americans. Imagine if one such American met an African or an Asian, would they be considerate as we are? However, in the macro scale, racial tensions would be next to nil among the daily average population. I doubt the prison population will be as large as well since America's discriminatory policies such as the war on drugs explains why there's a massive prison population. Australia serves as a useful proxy for America in this alternate timeline. It limited non-white immigration until the 1970s to prevent primarily Asians from competing with white Australians. America could implement a similar policy thus would be much more white dominated today with the lower population. This America would only recently open up to multi-ethnic immigration. Overall, America would be seen in a much more positive light across the world since currently race relations highly color the world's perspective of America. Now I know this isn't the most plausible alternate history out there, but it is still interesting to consider how demographics can fundamentally change nations in history. I want to quote President Lyndon B. Johnson right now. If you can convince the lowest white man, he's better than the best colored man. He won't notice you're picking his pocket. Give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. So I think America would most likely be more egalitarian with less ethnic violence and distraction from the real inequalities in the nation. I mean that's just my thoughts but it could be possible. Thanks for watching and make sure to subscribe for more great content. This is Scholar of the World, signing out.
Oh, look at my African-American over here. Look at him. Are you the greatest? 